Welcome everyone. This is part three in our series on methods and metrics. We're gonna be talking about metrics for assessing natural language generation systems. We previously talked about classifier metrics and the issues seem relatively straightforward. As you'll see, assessment for NLG systems is considerably more difficult. Let's actually begin with those fundamental challenges. Maybe the most fundamental of all is that in natural language, there is more than one effective way to say most things. The data sets we have might have one or a few good examples of how something should be said, um, but that's just a sample of the many ways in which we could communicate effectively. And that leaves us with fundamental open questions about what comparisons we should make and how we should assess so-called mistakes. Relatedly, there's just an open question of what we're actually trying to measure. Is it fluency or truthfulness or communicative effectiveness or some blend of the three? As we think about different metrics, we might find that they capture one or a few of these and completely neglect others. And that's sure to shape the trajectory of our project and the actual goals that we achieve. So we have to be really thoughtful about what we're actually trying to measure in this space. Let's begin with perplexity. I would say what perplexity has going for it is that, is that it is at least very tightly knit to the structure of many of the models that we work with in NLG. So the core calculation is that given some sequence X of length N and a probability distribution P, the perplexity of X relative to that distribution P is the product of the inverse of all the assigned probabilities. And then we take an average here. There are many ways to express this calculation and many ways to connect with information theoretic measures. Let me defer those issues for just a second and I'll try to build up an intuition just uh, after getting through the core calculation. So that's perplexity. And then when we do token level perplexity, right? we want to assign perplexity to individual examples, we need to normalize by the length of those examples. And we do that in log space in order to capture a kind of geometric mean, which is arguably more appropriate for comparing probability values. And then if we want the, complex, the perplexity for an entire corpus, we again use a geometric mean of all the token level perplexity predictions. Um, and that gives us a single quantity over an entire batch of examples. What are the properties of perplexity? Well, its bounds are one to infinity with one the best, so we would like to minimize perplexity. It is equivalent to the exponentiation of the cross entropy loss. That's the tight connection with models that I wanted to call out. We often work with language models that use a cross entropy loss, and you can see that they are directly optimizing for a quantity that is proportional to perplexity. And that can be useful as a kind of getting a direct insight into the nature of your model's predictions. What value does it encode? Well, I think it's simple. Does the model assign high probability to the input sequences? That is, does it assign low perplexity to the input sequences? The weaknesses, there are many actually. First, it's heavily dependent on the underlying vocabulary. To see that, imagine an edge case where we take every word in the vocabulary and map it to a single UNC token. In that case, we will absolutely minimize perplexity, but our system will be useless. In that edge case, you can see that I could reduce perplexity simply by changing the size of my vocabulary. And that's a way that you could kind of game this metric inadvertently. As a result of that, we can't really make comparisons across data sets because of course they can have different vocabularies and different intrinsic notions of perplexity. And it's also even tricky to make comparisons across models. You can see that in my first weakness there. Um, if we do compare models, we need to fix the data set and make sure that the differences between the models are not inherently shaping the range of perplexity values that we're likely to see. Let's move on now into a family of what you might think of as n-gram-based methods for assessing NLG systems, beginning with the word error rate. So the fundamental thing here will be an edit distance measure. Um, and therefore you can see word error rate as a kind of family of measures depending on the choice of the edit distance function, which we would just plug in. The word error rate is the distance between the actual sequence X and some predicted sequence pred normalized by the length of the actual sequence. And if we would like the word error rate for an entire corpus, it's easy to scale it up, but there's one twist here. The way that's standardly calculated is that the numerator is the sum of all of the distances between the actual and predicted sequences, not normalized as it was up here for the word error rate. The normalization, it happens over the entire corpus. It's the sum of all the lengths of the actual strings in the corpus. So we have one average as opposed to taking an average of averages. 
The properties of the word error rate, its bounds are zero to infinity, and we would like to minimize it, so zero is the best. The value encoded is similar to F scores. We would like to answer the question, how aligned is the predicted sequence with the actual sequence? And I've invoked F scores here because if our edit distance measure has notions of insertion and deletion, they play roles that are analogous to precision and recall. The weaknesses, well, first, we have just one reference text here. I called out before that there are often many good ways to say something, whereas here we can make only a single comparison. And it's also, maybe this is more fundamental, word error rate is a very syntactic notion. Just consider comparing texts like, it was good, it was not good, and it was great. They're likely to have the identical word error rates, even though the first two differ dramatically in their meanings, and the first and the third are actually rather similar in their meanings. That semantic notion of similarity is unlikely to be reflected in the word error rate. Let's move now to blue scores. This is another n-gram based metric, but it's going to try to address the fact that we want to make comparisons against multiple human created reference texts. It has a notion of precision in it, but it's called modified n-gram precision. Let me walk you through an example and hopefully that will motivate it. Imagine we had the candidate that had just seven instances of the word the in it. And we have two reference texts, presumably written by humans. The cat is on the mat and there is a cat on the mat. The modified precision takes for the token the, the maximum number of times that the occurs in any reference text, and that's two, the reference one here. And it divides that by the number of times that the appears in the candidate, which is seven. And that will give us two over seven as the modified n-gram, one-gram precision score for this candidate. There's also a brevity penalty, which will play the role of something like recall in the blue scoring. So we have a quantity R, which is the sum of all the minimal absolute length differences between candidates and reference. We have C, which is the total length of all the candidates. And then we said that the brevity penalty is one if C is greater than R, otherwise it's an exponential decay off of the ratio of R and C. And again, that will play kind of the notion of recall. And then the blue score is simply the product of that brevity penalty with the sum of the weighted modified n-gram precision values for each n-gram value n considered. So we'd probably go one through four, that's a standard set of n-grams to consider. We would sum up all those notions of uh, modified n-gram precision for each n, and possibly weight them differently depending on how we want to value one grams, two grams, three grams, and four grams. So that's the blue scoring. What are its properties? Its bounds are zero and one, and one is the best but we have really no expectation that any system will actually achieve one because even comparisons among human translations or human created texts will not have a blue score of one. The value encoded is an appropriate balance of modified precision and recall under the guise of that brevity penalty. It's very similar to the word error rate in that sense, but it seeks to accommodate the fact that there are typically multiple suitable outputs for a given input, and that's a real strength of blue scoring. The weaknesses, well, this team has argued that blue scores just fail to correlate with human um, scores for translations. And that's kind of worrying because blue scores were originally motivated in the context of machine translation. And the issues that they identify are like, it's very sensitive to n-gram order in a way that human intuitions are not. And it's insensitive to the type of the n-grams. And so again, just kind of consider comparisons like that dog, the dog, and that toaster. Those will likely have very similar blue scores, um, but that dog and the dog are just inherently much more similar than that dog and that toaster in virtue of the fact that that and the, it's just a difference at the level of functional vocabulary versus dog and toaster is a really contentful change. And then as we move into topics that are more closely aligned with NLU, we possibly have an even more worrying picture. So this team argues that blue is just a fundamentally incorrect measure for assessing dialogue systems. And that could be an indicator that it's not going to be appropriate for many kinds of NLG tasks in NLU. That's just a sample of two n-gram based metrics. I thought I'd mention a few more to give you a framework for making some comparisons. So I mentioned the word error rate. That's fundamentally edit distance from a single reference text. Blue, as we've seen, is modified precision and a brevity penalty, kind of recall notion, comparing against many reference texts. Rouge is a recall-focused variant of blue that's focused on assessing summarization systems. 
Meteor is interestingly different because it's trying to push past simple n-gram matching and capture some semantic notions. It's a unigram-based measure that does an alignment measure between not only exact matches of unigrams, but also stem versions and synonyms, really trying to bring in some semantic aspects. And CIDR is similar. This is gonna be even a more semantic notion because it's gonna do its comparisons in vector space. It's kind of approximately a weighted cosine similarity between TF IDF vectors created from the corpus. Finally, in closing, I just wanted to exhort you all to think about more communication-based metrics in the context of NLU. For NLU, it's worth asking whether you can evaluate your system based on how well it actually communicates in the context of a real-world goal, as opposed to just comparing different strings that are inputs and uh, reference texts. And we've actually seen an example of that in our assignment in Bake Off on color reference, we didn't really assess how well your system could reproduce the utterances that were in the corpus. Rather, our fundamental notion was listener accuracy, which was keying into a communication goal. How well is your system actually able to take messages and use them to figure out what the speaker was referring to in a simple color context? And for much more on that and a perspective on a lot of these issues, I encourage you to check out this paper that was led by Ben Newman. It began as a course project for this class and grew into a really successful paper.